Mark chapter 1 this morning, we're going to be looking in verses 40 through 45, and I'd like to begin by reading our text, Mark chapter 1 and verse number 40. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take your word, and you would teach it to us, and that you would change us, through the truth that we learn and that you would remind us especially today that we have a wonderful message to share with the world around us. And Lord, I pray that we would not be selfish with that message, but that we would give it out freely, generously, that other people might know you as we do as their personal Lord and Savior. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The verses we just read record one of the first miraculous healings that Jesus performed. And it's significant that the very first, one of the first at least, uh, healings of the Lord Jesus was of a man who had leprosy. And his reaction in this particular story, I think, is, is especially instructive for us. Leprosy is an infectious de- disease, and in Jesus' day, there was no known cure for it. This man came to Jesus in desperation, because if not healed, it, it would result in a slow and a painful death, and a lonely death at that. Because of his infectious nature, people often had to live in isolation or in leper colonies. So the fact that this man came and found Jesus and addressed him so closely as he did really speaks of this man's courage, but also his desperation. The Bible tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion on him and he healed him immediately. Jesus then told him to go to the priest and show himself and fulfill the the law of the Old Testament concerning leprosy. But the man went out, and instead of doing what Jesus said to do, he began to tell everybody what Jesus had done for him. He began to publish it abroad and began to broadcast to everyone that Jesus had healed him. And as a result, an enormous number of people came to see Jesus. In fact, so many that Jesus had to get out of the city and go into the country so that he would have, people would have room to gather around him. I've entitled the message today, The Loudmouth Leper. Because I find it so curious that here's this man that Jesus healed. But Jesus told him, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Go and show yourself to the priest and and fulfill that. But don't say anything to any man. And what did he do? He went out and he started to tell everybody. On the other hand, we as disciples of Christ have been commanded... Go and preach the gospel to every creature. We've been commanded, tell everybody that you can. And what do we do too often? We stay silent. Really, this leper is an illustration to you and me of how we ought to be. Even though he did it in disobedience. Look at the results. So many people were drawn to Jesus. And, and here's, here's what I want to propose to you today that if God could use the disobedience of this leper in such a great way, then just think how much God could use our obedience if we will obey His command and share the gospel. 
Let's look at some details of this story. First of all, notice the disease that he had. It says in verse number 40 that there came a leper to him. A leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and saying unto him, If I will, thou can if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So this man had this terrible disease, disease of leprosy. It's not something that's very common in any first world country today, although it still exists in the world um, often in more uh, third world type places. But in most places, uh, because of our medicine and because of uh, just our, our practices of, of uh, uh, hygiene and our uh, sanitation and things like that, it's not as much of an issue today as it was in Jesus' day. But one thing about leprosy is that it's a very contagious and infectious disease. And it was a what began as a skin disease with all of these terrible sores that would develop on, on a person's skin. But over time, as the disease progressed, it would begin to attack the nerves. It would begin to attack deeper tissue. Uh, it would result in muscle weakness, loss of feeling, and eventually it would result in death. So to be diagnosed with leprosy oftentimes was a fatal diagnosis. Leprosy was such a serious disease that in the Old Testament law, there were specific directions given on how to deal with it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13, or excuse me, Leviticus chapter 13, Leviticus chapter 13. Somebody uh, recently uh, mentioned to me about this, uh, this passage. Uh, when I was going to teach on it. And, uh, well, here's a little bit. Have you ever been reading through your Bible and uh, you come across the book of Leviticus and you get into it a little ways and you start getting grossed out? You get to this this portion here in, in Leviticus 13 and 14 and it starts talking about boils in the skin and scabs and raised and white hairs and, ugh, you know, all this just gross stuff. And then you get later in the book of Leviticus and you get, a, you get a, a hand guide on how to properly butcher an animal. And it talks about, you know, separating the fat above the litter from, liver from the call and all of this stuff. I mean, it's, yeah, it can get kind of gross sometimes. Why did God include instructions like this in Leviticus as we're going to read about leprosy? Well, as a nation, it was important for them just for the physical health side of it that they had to have a, a way of dealing with these, you know, uh, incidents where there might be an infectious disease to keep it from spreading so people would stay healthy. In Leviticus 13, look at verses 45 and 46. We're going to spare all of the gory details today and just look at what uh, a person who was diagnosed with leprosy had to do. Leviticus 13 verses 45 and 46. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean. He shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. So, again, this is just a snippet of part of the rules in the Old Testament law about leprosy. But if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you had to do two things. First of all, if you were in the company of anyone, you had to cover your face. And you had to cry, unclean, unclean. You had to let people know, look, I'm not just covering my face because something smells funny. I have a disease and I don't want to give it to you. And then secondly, you had to dwell alone. You had to separate. So we came all too familiar with the term social distancing and isolation. Well, that's, that's what they had to do. They had to, uh, they had to stay away from others so that they didn't spread it. So to have leprosy meant that you were going to be living a life of seclusion. And the only people you could have any close contact with would be other lepers. Uh, but it also meant that you were dealing with pain. You were dealing with numbness. You were dealing with a progressively worse disease that if not cured, you knew it was going to be fatal. And that's what this man had that came to Jesus. He was a leper. He came to Jesus, and notice what he asked Jesus. We're back in Luke or Mark chapter 1 now. He said, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. Notice the faith that's in that man's statement right there. He came to Jesus, and he didn't ask, hey, Jesus, have you got a cure for leprosy? He said, if you will, you can make me clean. He already knew enough about Jesus, and more importantly, he already believed enough about Jesus to have faith that Jesus could heal him if he would. Now, leprosy 
while it is a horrible physical disease, is actually a very good example of another disease, a spiritual disease, which is sin. Part of the reason I believe that God included uh, uh, these stories about the lepers is to use it to illustrate to us just how dangerous sin is and how important it is that it's dealt with and how that we need the Lord to heal us from it. Think about the correlations between leprosy and sin. Both leprosy and sin cause wounds and sores. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 says, Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Jesus was talking to the Israelites there. And was he talking about their physical condition when he said you're full of sores from the bottom of your foot to the top of your head? No, he was talking about their spiritual condition. They had rebelled against God over and over and over again and God in mercy had dealt with them to try and bring them back to a right fellowship with Him and they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And God said, your, your whole body is sin sick and it's causing you pain. See, that's the thing about sin. and Just like leprosy, it causes us pain. It, it, it makes you miserable. Not only does it cause wounds and sores, but it makes you weak. Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh, this sinful body that we still live in, is, is weakened because of sin. And that's why Paul said that even though he wanted to do good, oftentimes he found that he couldn't do it. Because there wasn't the strength in his, in his person, in his body, to be able to resist the temptation to sin. It makes you sore, it makes you weak, it makes you numb. One of the things leprosy does is it progresses. It attacks the nerves and you lose feeling. You get a neuropathy because of it. And, and the result is that you don't have the sensitivity that, uh, that you used to have. We well, you know sin does the same thing. Sin numbs us. Ephesians 4.19 talks about being past feeling. People who are past feeling and have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. The Bible talks about having our consciences seared like with a hot iron. That's what sin does. It makes you numb. You know, if you're living right with God and you sin, when you sin, there is a, there's a pang there. It was, there's a twinge of guilt. There's, a, there's kind of a, ooh, a wince to that when you do it. But you know, if you do it again... It doesn't hurt quite as much. And if you do it some more and you do it some more and you do it some more, you get so used to that sin that you barely even feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's entirely possible for a Christian to get to that point. And certainly it is, it is very, very likely that a lost person is not going to feel that pain of guilt when they sin because it causes numbness. Another thing about it, it's contagious. We don't think about sin as contagious, but it really, it is one of those contagious diseases because if you have a mom and a dad, they gave it to you. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We are all sinners because going all the way back to our first father, Adam, he sinned and he passed that on to all of us. If you're human, you have caught the disease, the disease of sin. It results in separation. Remember, the leper has to be in the, in the leper colony, can't be around other people because he doesn't want to give them the disease. Well, our sin separates us from God. In the garden, we see that illustrated when God came after Adam and Eve sinned. God came and they hid themselves and God says, Adam, where art thou? Why did God ask that? Because he wanted Adam to realize that there was now a separation between him and God. Whereas before they could fellowship without anything in between them, without any hindrance, now there is something hindering that fellowship. It was sin. It makes you unfit to dwell in the city too. In the same way that sin makes us unfit to dwell in the presence of God. He is of holier eyes than to behold evil. God is so holy that nothing sinful, nothing unholy can dwell in His presence. Revelation chapter 21, 27 says that there shall in no wise enter into it Anything that defileth, 
Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this man had a disease that doomed him to a life of separation. So he went to the only one that he knew could heal his disease. He went to Jesus. And in the same way, everyone is born with the disease of sin. And the only way that you can be healed from that disease is to come to Jesus. And notice what Jesus did when this man came to him. It says in Mark chapter 1 verse 41 that Jesus was moved with compassion. First thing we note about our Savior is His compassion on this man. He didn't look at this man in disgust. He didn't look at this man and think, Ugh, get away from me, you leper. No, He looked at this man and He had sympathy. He felt this man's pain. He, he put himself in this man's shoes, as it were, and said, how would I feel if I were him? And Jesus genuinely cared about this man. Most people would have avoided a leper at all costs. If a man came in and, and it was obvious that he had leprosy, everybody would scatter. They didn't want to chance it. They didn't want to risk it. But Jesus had compassion. He cared about the man. And then notice what he did. He reached out and he touched him. Now, according to the Old Testament law, if you came in contact with someone or something that had been contaminated with leprosy, you became unclean. But Jesus touched the man. We're not, we don't know exactly you know, what Jesus did. Maybe he just reached out and put his hand on his shoulder. Something simple like that. But do you realize that it may have been months or years since this man had had any kind of physical contact with another human being? This may have been the first time that anyone had reached out and touched him in any way. Not a handshake, not a side hug, not a fist bump, nothing. But Jesus reached out and put his hand on his shoulder. Why? Because Jesus cared. Jesus had genuine compassion on this man. He put forth his hand and he touched him. And Jesus said, all these words are beautiful. Jesus said, I will be thou clean. You know what? When Jesus said those words, immediately this man was healed of his leprosy. Any sores that might have been visible were gone. All of the numbness that had been there, feeling returned. All of the pain that he had been experiencing, relieved. All because Jesus said, I will be thou clean. Jesus healed the man. He didn't say, I will go take this medicine and 15 to 30 days you'll be better. No, he said, I will be thy clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. He was cleansed. See, that's what Jesus does. When a sinner comes to Jesus by faith and says, says, Lord, I need you to cleanse me. Jesus said, I will be thou cleansed and immediately the sin is gone. The sin is forgiven, his own blood is applied, and this man or this woman or this boy or this girl who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the eyes of God is now justified. That's what Jesus does. He felt what this man was feeling. He was sympathetic to his plight. He showed it by touching him and by healing him. We look at our Savior's example here in dealing with this man's disease and it teaches us so much about how we should help the world around us in dealing with their disease. Uh, You know, it's easy to stand up and cry against the evil of this world and say, that's wicked, you shouldn't be doing that. That's, In all honesty, that's easy in many ways. But to be willing to reach out and put a hand on a sinner's shoulder and say, look, you've got a problem but I want to help. To actually have compassion to enter into their suffering with them. To not just think, oh, I'm glad I'm not them, but to think, man, how awful must it be to feel like they're feeling and live like they're living. And actually enter into that suffering with them. Jude says in verse 22, and if some have compassion, making a difference. You know, our apathy will never win a soul to Christ. Being annoyed at, at, at lost people will never win a single soul to Christ. Only compassion and demonstrating the love of God will do it. 
Does that mean we ignore their sin? Absolutely not. Because you can't solve the problem if you don't address the problem. I mean, what if this man came to Jesus and Jesus said, Oh, I don't need to heal you. You don't really have leprosy. The man looks down and he's still covered in sores. He feels the pain. He's got the numbness. He knows he has leprosy. And if Jesus just said, Oh, you'll be fine. You don't need to worry about it. Would that have healed this man? No, it's when the problem was addressed that the man found healing. And so it is with the lost. We don't need to ignore their sin. We don't need to excuse their sin. And we certainly cannot uh, um, justify their sin. We have to address their sin, but we can absolutely love the sinner and we must. How do we view the lost? Do we view them with anger, apathy, or annoyance? Or do we view them with compassion? And here's one thing that will help us in viewing the lost with compassion is to remember what you were before you were saved and remember what you would be now if God hadn't saved you. A lot of times our problem is we forget. We have spiritual amnesia. Now, some of us were saved at a very young age. I, get, I understand that. I was saved when I was five years old. How many of you in here, you were saved before the age of 10? Raise your hand. You trusted Christ before the age of 10. Many, many people in this room. I'm going to guess that by the time you were 10, you hadn't had a chance to become a murderer or a drug dealer or living out on the streets, living a horrible life or anything like that. I'm going to guess that you probably, if you were saved that young, you grew up in a, in a good home, a Christian home maybe, probably going to church frequently, and you didn't have time before you were 10 years old to get involved in any kind of a horrible life of sin. And so you think, well, I wasn't that bad of a person. Friend, let me tell you something. If God hadn't saved you before you were 10, can you imagine what you would be right now? Whatever wickedness you can imagine, you are capable of that very wickedness. And it is only the grace of God that has worked in your life from that young age that has kept you from it. Never forget what you were before salvation or what you would be if it were not for salvation. Paul said in Titus chapter 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Paul, in writing to the believers, often reminded them what they were before salvation and what we would be were it not for salvation. And when you remember that and you look at a lost person, yeah, they may be living a horrible lifestyle, they may be involved in all kinds of wickedness and ungodliness, but when you have that conscious thought, that would be me if it were not for God working in my life. It helps you have compassion. I remember my mom used to, used to say, but for the grace of God, there go I. It took me a long time as a little kid. Those words just, I didn't understand what she meant. She would see somebody and you know, it was obvious they were involved in some kinds of wickedness and she would say, but for the grace of God, there go I. I didn't know what that meant until I got much older and then I realized, oh, what she's saying is that if it weren't for God's grace that had worked in her life, she would be living like that person or worse. And so this leper came to Jesus with this horrible disease and, and God healed him. Jesus Christ healed him with just a word. He said, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy left him. So notice number two, we've seen the disease. Notice now the directions. Verse 43, Jesus straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man. That's pretty clear, pretty direct instructions, right? Don't say anything to anyone. Go to thy way and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So Jesus told this man, don't talk to anybody. You need to go right now. You need to go find a priest and you need to do what the Old Testament law said to be declared clean according to the Old Testament law. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament law. 
And he obeyed it as he directed others to do as well when he was here on this earth. Matthew 5, 17, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And the instruction that he gave this man was in keeping with the instructions of Leviticus um, chapter 14, where it, we won't read there this right now, but it, they were told if you have a, a sword and you have leprosy, then you've got to go through this process to be declared clean. And that involved the priest. I'm so glad, by the way, that it's not the job of the preacher today to, you know, make sure you don't have leprosy. We have doctors for that. But this man had to go to the priest. He had to go and see uh, the priest, and the priest had to examine him and had to, make, had to make an official declaration that he was now clean. So what Jesus was doing here was telling this man to obey the Bible, to do what God's Word had instructed him to do. Jesus did this same, <clears throat> excuse me, the same thing in Luke chapter 17. There we find the story of the ten lepers, and he told them all to go show themselves to the priest. Remember, only one realized that he was healed and came back and said, Thank you to Jesus for it. But it's the same instruction go see the priest. Now, why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus say to this man, You've got to go do this? I've healed you. His healing was not conditional by the way. It was not conditioned upon his obedience in this instance. It was he had declared his faith, and so Jesus said, you're healed. But then after that, he said, go to the priest. Well, if Jesus, think about this, if Jesus had disobeyed the law, or if he had led others to disobey the law, he would be guilty of sin himself. Because 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is the transgression of the law. If you break one of God's laws, you're a sinner. And if Jesus had broken the law or led other people to break the law, then he would have been guilty. And so he was leading this man to do what God's Word said to do. And he also told him, don't tell anybody. Don't even talk to anybody. Now the implication, I believe, is that after he had fulfilled this, then maybe he would have been at liberty to talk to other people. But Jesus was very specific. Don't talk to anybody yet until you go to the priest. Now why? Well, I think... If we just pause for a moment and, and think about the story, it becomes pretty evident why it was important for this man to follow through on Jesus' instruction. In fact, I think in the words of Jesus in verse 44, we have the clue. Notice he said that he was to go to the priest, show thyself to the priest, offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. It's because he wanted this man to have a good testimony. Think about it. If he left from Jesus's, as he did, and we'll see this in a minute, but if, if he were to go out and just start going through town, hey, everybody, Jesus cleansed me. Isn't it wonderful? You got to meet Jesus. He cleansed me from my leprosy. He can take care of your problems too. He's going around. All these people know about this guy is the last time they saw him, he was go covering his mouth crying, unclean, unclean. And now all of a sudden he's intermingling with them and there's now a big question mark in people's minds what is this man doing? And now he's associating with Jesus. This man's violating the Old Testament law and he says he's doing it because Jesus had healed him. There's a connection there that could potentially put Jesus in the gospel in a negative light. It was all about his testimony, you see. And that's why Jesus instructed him, go and show yourself to the priests. Living in disobedience has a negative effect on the message of the gospel. It's that plain. As a Christian, if we are not doing what God wants us to do, then it's going to have an effect on our ability to witness to others. It's our testimony. This man did not follow Jesus' instructions, verse 45. But he went out and began to publish it much. So notice number three, the disobedience. We have the disease... Jesus healed him of the directions that Jesus gave. And now notice this man's disobedience. Now I'm not, I, I, I'm really, I don't want to be hard on this man. I put myself in his position. Who knows how long he had lived with leprosy. I mean, he was just excited. Wouldn't you be? Wouldn't you be? And so because he was excited, he just wanted to tell somebody. He assumed that other people would be excited too. And so he went out and he began to publish it 
much abroad. He braised abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city. So he went out and just because we have to be honest, we have to say he disobeyed Jesus' directions. Now I hope that he eventually made it to the priest and did all that Jesus said to do, but when Jesus said don't talk to anybody, he went out and began to talk to people, he was disobeying. The result was that so many people heard about it and so many people wanted to see Jesus for themselves that Jesus had to move out of the city into the countryside just to have space for everyone to gather. And I get it. I I, I get it. Even though it was disobedience, I understand why this man was so excited. And my thought is this. If this man's disobedience was that effective in drawing attention to Jesus... Just think what God can do through our obedience. And I firmly believe that God wants to and God can do even more through our obedience than He did through this man's disobedience for three reasons. First of all, because we have a better motive than this man. We have a better motive. This man had been healed from a physical disease, a terrible one, no doubt, one that I would never wish upon anyone, one that was going to kill him if not cured. It was a big deal. But it was still just a physical disease. And you know what? This man has since died. That physical healing was only temporary. It was only for a little while. But if you know Christ as your Savior, you have been healed from a spiritual disease. You have been rescued from eternal death. Your healing is not temporary. It is permanent. And you have been cured from the worst ailment in the history of man. You've been cured from sin. And so I say we have a better motive than this man. This man was so excited because God had healed him physically. Should we not have a little bit of enthusiasm about the fact that God has healed us spiritually? Should we not just assume that, hey, this is is good news that other people should want to hear? I mean, this man could not contain himself because he was so excited. I know how it is. The longer we're saved, the more stoic we get too often. We feel like to express any emotion about things spiritual, is somehow beneath us. Let me help us out a little bit. It's okay to be happy Christians. It is. I mean, if a world, if a lost person were to walk in the midst of our church, what, are they, what would they see? Let's imagine that they saw a room full of people who's, who were just stoic and somber. silent as the grave, as it were. And they come in and they, they hear us singing some, some song like, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. That would be in children's church, right? I'm so happy and here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. It's like, okay, let's just make everything minor key, people. Come on. Are are you really, really happy about what Jesus has done for us? Versus this, they come in and they see people. I'm not saying that we're giddy. I'm not saying that we're silly. I'm not saying we find everything hilarious because there's a lot of serious stuff in life. But they see people who obviously have joy. They have a little bit of a smile on their face. And it's a genuine smile. Listen, I... You can spot a fake and they can spot a fake too. You know when somebody's just giving you a fake smile. It's a genuine smile. They're genuinely happy to have someone here, genuinely happy to talk to them, genuinely joyful in the Lord. It's okay to be enthusiastic about what God has done for you. We have a better motive. But number two, I believe God can do more through our obedience because we have a better mandate. What do I mean by that? Well... Jesus told this man, don't talk to anyone. Jesus, on the other hand, has commanded us, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Our mandate is to go and to tell others. That's better than his, which was to not tell anyone. 
We have a better mandate. We've been instructed to be witnesses, to share the gospel, to tell the lost how they can be saved. The apostles said in Acts 4 and verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We have an obligation to tell the world. And number three, I believe that God can do more through our obedience because we have a better message. His message was, go to Jesus, He can heal your body. Our message is, come to Jesus, He can heal your soul. It's the gospel we're talking about. One of, the, one of the big errors of the prosperity gospel heresy is the, the emphasis on the physical. You know, come to Jesus and you won't be sick and come to Jesus and you'll have all the money you need. First of all, God never promises that. Second of all, it places the emphasis in the wrong place. It's, it's emphasizing the temporary, material, physical things. What's much more important than that is the eternal and the spiritual things. And that's what the gospel is. It's a message of eternal healing from sin. We have a better message. We have a better mandate. We have a better motive. And so I say that God can do more through our obedience than He did even through this man's disobedience. If a man who was cleansed from this physical disease could have so much enthusiasm about telling others what Jesus did for him, then we who've been healed from spiritual disease the disease of sin, can have enthusiasm too. If this man made such an impact through his disobedience to Jesus' command, we can give him the benefit of the doubt and say, well, he was just excited. But still, if God could use him when he didn't do what what Jesus said, then how much more can God use us when we do what Jesus said, when we go and preach the gospel? And I direct your attention back to verse number 45 in Mark chapter 1. Again, what did this man do? He went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. You see that little word, began? He began to do it. You know what that implies? It implies that there's no end. It doesn't say that he did it at a point in time went out and told somebody and was done and it was over. But no, this marks the point in time where he began to do it. With the implication that it kept on happening. For the rest of this man's life, he had quite a story to tell. He would meet somebody and I just imagine they would ask, Hey, I thought you had leprosy. And this man said, I did but let me tell you what happened. And he would get to share with them about Jesus. If you know Christ as your Savior, you have your own story. You have your own testimony. Maybe you were saved later in life and you meet someone from your past and they say, hey, you didn't used to ever go to church. What happened? There you have an opportunity to say, you're right, I didn't used to go to church, but let me tell you what Jesus did for me. He began to publish it abroad and blaze abroad the matter. What are we doing? God has done so much for us. Don't you think we should be eager to publish it much for His name? Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that we would never forget what You've done for us. That we would always be grateful for it that we'd always be willing to share it with someone else. Lord, we cannot justify this man's disobedience. But it can encourage us to be obedient, to tell others, to share the gospel. So Lord, I pray that you would take it to that you would help us to take it to heart today. And that through us, you would be glorified through the salvation of souls, through our witness, through our testimony, through our sharing the gospel, that people would be saved. And I pray it in Jesus' name.